advantage for democracy uh, activists all over the world, but especially in the MENA region, because as you can, as you would see from her presentation, she knows the MENA region and has been studying the MENA region for, for a long time, so she's an expert in that. So we have we will give each one of them about 15 to 20 minutes uh, talk, and then we will have 20 minutes for a Q&A before we finish this session and go back to, to the other room. Uh, so uh, try to be uh, great. So Damon, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. It's a real honor and pleasure to be with all of you today. And I want to offer a special thanks to our organizer, Cecilia Rodman. When I first became president at MED, you were the first advocate of democracy in the Muslim world to come see me at the endowment and to make the clear case that you always do on this. And I've appreciated that. Um, I've appreciated the friendship in your council, and especially grateful for his advice um, when I visited Tunisia earlier this year. Um, to hear firsthand about the rollback of democratic gains in this country from our partners on the ground. And sadly, as we're convening here, as we were just talking about, we're seeing more arrests in Tunisia and worrying signs of a broader crackdown on civil society, unsurprisingly. Um, so I address this audience with an incredible sense of humility. Um, uh, gathered in this room were some of the, the, the leading authorities on the Middle East and North Africa, including my own board member, Dr. Amani Kamal, as you just heard. It's such an honor to have her serving on the board, along with the MED staff. They, <coughs> you, are the experts here. And so it is with a great sense of humility, because we also have others that have been on the front lines, forging hard-won democratic gains in your own countries. And some of you have paid very high prices for your belief in democracy. We give you a shout out, Ali. Welcome. So because of your expertise, I'm not going to presume to tell all of you what you should think about democracy in the Muslim world. We believe in it. But just as my organization, NED, doesn't presume to tell the citizens of any country how they should be governed, they're the experts. And despite all of the challenge, democracy's challenges, the research tells us that most would prefer to live in freedom. It's a simple fact. So today I'd like to put some of what's happening in the Middle East and North Africa in particular into context with the forces that are buffeting democracy globally and to share with you a little bit about Ned's approach to supporting the courageous men and women who are on the front line of freedom in some of the world's most dangerous and repressive places. And so today, I think you all know we find ourselves at a constant moment <coughs> for democracy around the world. In each of the past 17 years, the number of countries that have moved away from democracy has exceeded the number of countries that have moved towards democracy. And this isn't happening because people suddenly stop wanting freedom, of course. It's on the, on the contrary. Um, as the Arab barometer tells us, and you'll see a little bit more fresh data from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Tamal, um, the survey that despite the growing concerns about the effectiveness of democracy, substantial majorities in the country still prefer, prefer to a non-democratic system. And these views are borne out by the democracy activism that continues to flare that we see every day in the most repressive societies. The protests that erupted in Iran following the death of Bassamini, in which the IRGC itself has confirmed that the average age of those they've arrested is 15 years old, losing a generation. The Saudi activists, academics, and intellectuals who bravely signed their names recently to the recently released A People's Vision for Reform in Saudi Arabia, and more broadly in the Muslim world beyond the United just this past weekend, we saw thousands of we Muslims who, who surrounded a mosque in southwestern China to prevent authorities from removing it in the dome and the minarets, and then a widening crackdown on religious freedoms. And so throughout the world, we see this demand for freedom. It remains strong. But so too is the authoritarians and the populace determination to defeat it. So no, of course democracy isn't perfect. It's complex, it's messy, and it remains a work in progress in our own experience in the United States, as most of us as Americans, we know that, it shows us that. But over the long term, research does underscore that citizens in democratic societies are healthier, happier, wealthier, and safer. A country, a country that switches from non-democracy to democracy achieves about 20% higher GDP per capita in the long run. Research shows that democracy is associated with lower inflation, lower political instability, higher economic freedom. It's linked to key drivers of economic growth, such as improvements in education and in healthcare. But it's also true that people, including those in the MENA region, have grown skeptical of democracy's benefits 
particularly in terms of their own economic opportunity. When government's corrupt, prices are skyrocketing, and unemployment is rampant, the stability and economic growth in places like China can make non-democratic systems start to seem attractive. These doubts are further reinforced by the siren song of the autocrat's narrative, which goes like this, democracy doesn't work, democracy doesn't work, democracy fosters and chaos. Democracies aren't up to the task of keeping us safe. Only strong leadership can provide the stability and order we need to defend against threats. So this sounds familiar probably if you're Tunisian today. Yet framing the narrative this way as Kaisai had and other populists, it distracts people from the fact that the alternative to all the messy democratic liberation is losing a voice and determining our own future and leaving all decisions to one man or one clique. There is another imperative, which of course all of you are very familiar with. The Middle East is unfit for democracy. It's a quagmire, unsolvable, unfixable. Islam is incompatible. They don't want freedom. They're, they want iron fisted rulers. Dictators provide stability. Military regimes provide stability. And democracy just leads to anti American Islamic regimes. So at the endowment, we believe the desire for freedom is universal, and both the MENA region and the broader Muslim world are no exception. A view that we share with many of you, with distinguished scholars, activists, not only the hundreds of millions of Muslims live in democracies today, but there's a historic legacy which you know well from the golden age of Islam starting in the 8th century. We witness a convergence of pluralistic intellectual climate with scientific, cultural, and economic achievements. And many of you have argued that there are no inherent contradictions between democratic and Islamic values, of course. Islamic principles recognize individual freedoms, rights, human dignity, rule of law, justice, and the consultative decision making. And that obstacles to democratization in the region are more a product of political, historic, and economic factors than religious exceptionalism, as we heard earlier today. And that view is borne out in countries from Indonesia, Malaysia, and Asia, Albania, and Kosovo, and Europe, Cote d'Ivoire, Gambia, across others in Africa, where hundreds of millions of Muslims live in democracies, even if imperfect with many more living in flawed democracies from Nigeria, <coughs> Turkey, to Pakistan. Even where democracy has been less successful, the desire for freedom has been demonstrated over the past two decades in waves of popular uprisings, as people have risked their lives calling out for political change. But we can't be naive. Democracy faces serious headwinds around the world, and nowhere are the challenges greater than in the human region. Autocrats are doing everything they can persuade democracy advocates to throw up their hands, to give up, to force them out of their countries. But giving up is not compatible with the yearning of the human spirit for freedom. You spend any time with the activists on the front lines and you know what drives them and it's insatiable. So sitting on the sidelines and pretending it's not our problem when people are repressed, arrested, tortured, it's not an option. It's in the interest of the free world to support democracy and democracy advocates even in places where it seems impossible to policymakers like Iran and Afghanistan today. The autocrats are playing a tough offense, and we in the democratic community, we must sharpen and start game and do the same. We must adapt, innovate, learn, and work in common cause. And that's what the team at the endowment is doing. So my perspective is driven by the work that we do at NED. And for those who don't know as well, the NED was created, as Robin said, with congressional backing 40 years ago as a bipartisan nonprofit foundation dedicated to strengthening democratic institutions and values around the world. And we bring diverse domestic constituencies that disagree in the United States. We bring them together from both political parties, business and labor, through the support of the Med for Institutes, IRI, NDI, the Center for National Private Enterprise, the Solidarity Center. And last, last year, we made nearly two to $300 million in grants to 1,500 civil society and media organizations working in more than 100 countries. And while we care deeply about democracy everywhere, including here in the United States, our remit is entirely outside U.S. borders. And so in some respects, we're that rarest of creatures in Washington for, throughout our history, and even thankfully today, we've enjoyed incredibly strong bipartisan support in both, whether it's an administration of the White House and Capitol Hill, and while we're funded by American taxpayers, we're set up to be independent from the U.S. government. We have an independent board with people like uh, our, our, our following speaker. And it allows us to remain nimble 
flexible, responsive, responsive in crises, unconstrained by diplomatic security or other considerations that affect government or other official actors. And our independence means that we can be consistent, not zigzag with policy decisions or competing priorities, and remain singularly focused on support for democracy and freedom. It's a real privilege. So when the United States suddenly pulled out of Afghanistan two years ago, we were able to stand by our partners and evacuate them to safety, even as we doubled down our support for Afghan Democrats remaining inside the country under the Taliban today. Afghanistan remains one of our largest programs, underscoring our commitment to democracy advocates in the toughest places. So wherever democracy and human rights are at risk in the world, you'll find that great grantees working in support of civil society, human rights, religious freedom, and independent media. But we don't run programs, and we don't tell our grantees what they should do. We support their ideas. We stand by them in their struggle. So too often, American policymakers have given in to the false promise that a partnership with a dictator or a military regime would provide stability and ostensibly serve American interests. But as we've seen time and again, any stability gained in the short term is far outweighed by the damage done over the long run as corruption deepens, resentments fester, and disenfranchisement leads radicalization, hurting American interests for generations. By comparison, the endowment has been steadfast in its commitment to the people and their desire to determine their own future, regardless of who's in charge in Washington or in the region or which way the winds blow. So I'm an optimist by nature, but these are challenging times in the Middle East and North Africa for even the most fervent believers in the power of democracy. Gulf countries portray themselves as modernizing and friendly to the West, but underneath the shiny exterior, they repress citizens who speak out and are playing an outsized, corrosive role in the region, often to stifle freedom and democracy. According to the Iran Human Rights Group, Iran has so far this year executed an estimated 277 people accused of participating in the mass protests, including at least 90 in the last four weeks alone, making May the country's bloodiest month in five years. The Taliban continue their assault on the rights of Afghan women, denying them education and employment, and we see that those who resist the government's repression and violence in the provinces are often disappearing. Tunisia has weakened and eroded democratic gains, arresting political opponents, lawyers, journalists, and capturing or dismantling democratic institutions. Egypt is closed in public space under the pretext of national security as part of a larger push to eliminate dissent and challenge or threat the regime. And Turkey, once a promising model of democracy for the region, has experienced over a decade of democratic backsliding pressure on the media. In the latest election, President Erdogan faced the toughest challenge in his two-decade rule from the coalition of diverse opposition groups. He won. But the degree of opposition reflects an urgent need for democratic reforms and political pluralism, including within the rulemaking. So I could go on, but you no doubt you understand what's going on in the region as well better than I do. But the point is that while others have pulled out of me, particularly other donors in this space, as the work has become more difficult, Ned has doubled down, and we will continue to support Democrats in the region. So every country tends to think of what's taking place within its borders as specific and unique to its own history and circumstances. And to some degree, that's true. We put a huge priority on understanding the context we operate in. But make no, no mistake, the current threats to democracy in the Muslim world are not happening in isolation. They are linked to events taking place from Nicaragua, Venezuela, South Africa, North Korea, Belarus, and Ukraine. They're connected to a global collaborative of authoritarian, sometimes populist actors who are actively working to undermine democracy where it exists and to stop it from taking root where it doesn't. And in recent years, authoritarian regimes with Russia and China in the vanguard have banded together, taking their fight against freedom to new and dangerous levels, while sharpening their repression against their own people at home They've embarked on a sophisticated effort to corrupt and destabilize democracies everywhere. Their activities and ambitions are turbocharged by technology. And their influence can be felt in the region as the Arab League welcomes Syria as Assad back into the fold with open arms and by proxy embraces his close ally Vladimir Putin, despite Moscow's bloody record of bombing hospitals targeting civilians in Syria's war. We see China seeing the Muslim community to rally and support of the one million Uyghurs who are victims of Chinese Communist Party genocide, 
over the past decade. And we find China's, China's smart cities and facial recognition technology proliferate, enabling regimes to more effectively monitor their own populations. And we know that Iran sends weapons for Russia in support of the war in Ukraine, also to try and crush the hopes of its own people for freedom. As long as democracy persists, authoritarians can never feel entirely secure because they know that despite their rhetoric, often appropriating democracy and human rights, they don't govern with the consent of their people. They fear their people. The commitment of democracies to the open exchange of ideas, it renders them particularly vulnerable to an insidious form of influence known as sharp power, a concept introduced by Chris Walker. Hard power uses force to achieve an outcome. Soft power relies on persuasion. Sharp power is when an authoritarian state seeks to undermine democracy in other countries by capturing elites, inducing censorship, and stoking polarization through the spread of disinformation. And it's particularly effective when democracy is struggling to take root or it hasn't yet delivered the benefits people were expecting. The autocrat's compulsive need to undermine free societies provides confirmation, if you needed it, of the power and lure of democratic ideas. But there's reason for hope that you know about. Um, recently, the Washington Post had published an article about the unfinished business of the Arab Spring, arguing that the forces that unleashed the uprisings across the Middle East are as potent as ever. Quote, on the face of it, the Arab Spring failed, and spectacularly so, not only by failing to deliver political freedoms, but by further entrenching the rule of corrupt leaders. Yet as long as the conditions that provoked the original uprisings persist, the possibility of more unrest cannot be ruled out. For many in the Arab in the region, the Arab Spring is seen less as a failure than an ongoing process. We see that. Demonstrations that toppled the longtime presidents of Algeria and Sudan in 2019, protest movements in Iraq and Lebanon, they serve as a reminder the momentum that drove the revolt of a decade ago has not gone away. We've seen the argument, uh, for Wallace George is another professor who believes the upheaval of the past decade represents the start of a long process of change that does help ultimately transform the world. As he put it, I think we're going to see any stability. I don't think we're going to see any stability as long as dictators, military intelligence agencies, suffocate society. So there is no way of knowing when democratic momentum will be enough to defeat the autocrats. But I do know that the desire for freedom still burns in these in repressed places. Last week in Iran, in the midst of the surprise, we saw women political prisoners into Iran's notorious end in prison, including Sepedi Goya, Barat Hadid, Fezia Hashmi, and Arjus Mohammed. They held a protest against the execution of three protesters and the regime's increasing use of the death penalty. NED partners have been helping to ensure that Iranians have access to information during the crisis and that the world knows what's happening inside Iran. Sudanese resistance committees continue to campaign for peace, expanding and deepening networks of democratic solidarity across, across the country during this fighting. And then will continue to support Sudan civil society as it campaigns for civilian democratic rule. Morocco is one of the few countries in the region where there is space for democratic reforms post Arab Spring. And we remain committed to supporting the efforts in Morocco to further institutionalize and expand the gains that were granted in the 2011 Constitution. Despite the dire human rights situation and terrible risks involved in activism, Egypt's civil society remains resilient and adaptive, and it represents the only check on centralized authoritarian power, and we remain deeply committed to supporting them in their struggle. Democratization in Iraq is ongo ongoing, unfolding, messy, but the Iraqi people have shown the desire and willingness to fight for their rights, to fight for their freedoms, and the spirit drives activists, democracy actors, to advocate for better services, more accountability, better management of resources. And we have remained consistent over years in supporting Iraqis on their democratic journey. So there are other signs of long-term democratic gains in the region which tend to be less visible and obvious when the situation seems so bleak overall. One example, if you just think back 20 years, it is the overall growth of civil society and independent media compared with what it looked like two decades ago. It's a different landscape. The region's also benefited from periods of, periods of democratic experimentation. People have learned about designing constitutions and electoral systems, protecting rights and civil liberties, managing social and political cleavages. So even the failures are important to the region's learning and support of democracy. 
They provide the foundation for the next chapter. We've seen other women have faced increased repression. In many places, they've increasingly been at the helm of civic movements, demanding reform and change across the region. In 2011, 2019, more recently, Afghanistan and Iran. In an article just before, a former NED board member and NDI chair, Madeline Albright, before she died, she published something she wrote about a period during the Cold War when many people just assumed that Soviet-style governments would last forever because of their willingness to quash dissent before it could take hold. And then the Iron Curtain lifted and the Berlin Wall fell, taking the theory of totalitarian permanence with it. But democracy, she argued, is not a dying cause, but it's poised for a comeback in part because the two, the world's two most prominent authoritarian states, China and Russia, have squandered their best chance of offering an appealing alternative to liberal democracy. So there's no way to predict when a breakthrough might occur, and the future of any nation has to rest in the hands of its own people. But we saw during the fall of the Iron Curtain, during the Arab Spring, when there's momentum for change, it builds on itself. And unlike open societies, which have built-in shock absorbers providing outlets for people's frustration, repressive societies can seem stable when in truth they're actually quite brittle and combustible. This year on the anniversary of Egypt's January 25th Revolution, a writer who had just been released after seven years in prison, thank you for sharing this with me, Amira, he reflected on Egypt's liberation struggles from 1919 to the present day, describing each struggle as a building block with a future more democratic state. And he wrote, let, let us let this time, let, let us let time do its thing. Let us play the role of the next generation, the generations that follow it, will not forgive us if we overdo it or fall short of it. We have an experience to teach, a story to tell, and wounds to heal. In our hearts is a love for our children that overshadows the hatred of our opponents and the enemies of our revolution. We have a future that distracts us from ruminating on sad memories of the past and swimming in the seas of bitter tears. More democratic states may be under threat, even as the majority of people in most of these countries prefer to live in the and they're willing to risk everything to pursue it. So as the autocrats play a long game, so must we. Democracies must unite in a more focused and coordinated counter-mobilization counter against sharp power globally. And just as democracies work together to help Ukrainians defeat Russia and Taiwan safeguard its freedom, we cannot give up on democracy in the Middle East because it's difficult and messy. So at NED, we're aiming to help our partners outpace and outflank the autocrats by investing in democratic networks that will stay alive, that will thrive, that will share new ideas and best practices across movements and regions with new approaches to fighting disinformation, protecting the integrity of the information space, hacking kleptocracy, leveraging technology for democracy and fostering that democratic union. We're positioning ourselves to take advantage of emerging opportunities by investing in social movements and democratic organization, organizing and the lead up to elections even when they're not and we're going to continue to provide moral and material support to those who are fighting on the autocrats on the turf. So the struggle for freedom is not linear. And while democratic aspirations have not yet produced the intended results in recent years, in some cases we've seen even sharper repression. We know they remain resilient and persistent. Democratic openings and experiences, even when they fail or are crushed, they provide the crucial foundation for that next chapter of democratic experimentation, offering an ever greater prospect of success than the next opportunity. And I think we owe it to those who are courageous enough, those men and women who are fighting for freedom in the region on the front line, to stand with them in their effort to forge a path forward towards liberty. It won't be easy, but we've seen time and time again that ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world that's what's going to write democracy's next chapter, including in this region. Thank you.